Ocarina of Time never dies. After over a quarter century, millions of players, and countless infamous discoveries, OOT continues to be at the forefront of video game science with new and exciting techniques popping up all the time. But every once in a while, something special, something monumental is found that completely shifts the meta of speedrunning this game and forces us to reconsider nearly every route and category. Here, in the beginning of 2024, Ocarina of Time's 26th year since release, another such era-defining technique has been discovered. It's called Dynapoly Overflow Wrong Warping, or Dynawarp for short, and it has already completely upended one of the most stable and well-known routes the game had ever seen, and it's in the process of doing the same for several more. In this video, I'm going to break down exactly how it works in as much detail as possible so that more people can understand it, innovate on it, and help push the game we all love even further than we thought possible just a few short weeks ago. To start with, what is Dyna Warping and what makes it so disruptive? First, the result to get you interested. Dyna Warping is a new type of wrong warp glitch, capable of sending us from Dodongo's Cavern to any scene in the whole game, and where we end up is fully within player control. Not only that, but we can chain these warps indefinitely with just a little bit of careful planning, just by dying to trigger subsequent warps. And if we set Pharaoh's Wind in the midst of this and break the chain warping, we can return to the glitch just by returning to Pharaoh's Wind. If this sounds unbelievably powerful to you, well, you're right. It has already shaved over two minutes off of the defeat Ganon speedrun category, where the Ganondor wrong warp had held unwavering dominance for 12 years prior. And speedrunners are hard at work figuring out the best ways to implement it into longer, more complicated routes for categories like 100% and all dungeons. So, how does it work? Well, as you might have guessed, it's a little bit complicated. So, get comfy, and let's do a deep dive into the technical details. It might help to start at the end. How does the warp anywhere part work? Or maybe even simpler, how does traveling between two scenes work when just playing normally? Or even simpler than that, what's a scene? A scene is any continuous area in the game that you arrive in or leave via a fade-out screen transition. This game can only hold one scene in memory at a time, an easy fact to forget in the modern time of open-world video games. But if it takes a fade-out to reach a new area, you've transitioned between two scenes. There are a few ways to do that in OOT. You might play a warp song, a cutscene might take you somewhere new. But in this video, we're gonna focus on loading zones, environmental collision polygons, or pieces of floor, that are flagged to trigger a scene transition when you're directly over them. Within the data structure of all collision polygons are five bits, which determine where that polygon will send you when you step on it. Value zero means it will not send you anywhere, leaving values one to 31 reserved for loading zones. But of course, OOT has way more than 31 scenes, so this number couldn't possibly refer to a scene directly. In fact, it is an index into the current scene's table of possible exits. Every scene has one of these, and it is simply a list of indexes into a larger master list of all possible entrances in the whole game. So if a polygon has value two in the spot reserved for its exit, and you step on it, the game will look at position two in the scene's exit table, and then use that number to look up where to send the player in the master entrance table. So what will we find in the entrance table? Each table entry has a few pieces of data. The scene ID will determine which scene you go to. The spawn will determine which entrance point in that scene you'll end up at, since there are potentially many ways into the same scene. And some other transition settings data, which is mostly irrelevant to us, such as what kind of visual transitions to use when fading in and out. Additionally, whenever a loading zone refers us to an entrance table index, we have to offset ourselves 0, 1, 2, or 3 further entries down the table, depending on whether we are child link at daytime, child at nighttime, adult at daytime, or adult at nighttime, in that order. Let's step through an example in Dodongo's Cavern. First, let's start with the scene's exit list. For Dodongo's Cavern, this list has only two entries, 242 and 40B. If we look at the entrance table, we can see that these correspond to Death Mountain Trail from Dodongo's Cavern and King Dodongo's Room from Dodongo's Cavern, respectively. This makes perfect sense, as these are the only two loading zones in the scene. So the loading zone leading to Death Mountain Trail will have an exit index of one, 
pointing to entrance table index 242 in child daytime, or plus one to 243 in child night, plus two to 244 in adult day, or plus three to 245 in adult night. And the loading zone leading to the boss room will have exit index two, pointing to entrance table index 40B in child daytime, or again, the next three indices at other ages and times. Now, back to the scene exit list. Given that loading zones can use five bits to specify which exit to take, with zero meaning no warp, each scene has up to 31 possible exits in this list. However, most scenes don't need nearly that many. Dodongo's Cavern, as we've seen, only leads to two other scenes naturally, Death Mountain Trail and King Dodongo's Boss Room. When a scene is done listing its available exits, it moves on immediately to define other data, usually settings related to lighting. So what would happen if a loading zone in Dodongo's Cavern specified to use exit three for some reason, when the exit list for the scene is only two entries long? An index larger than the size of the list just reads from whatever memory is after the list and interprets what it finds there as a list entry. This is called an out of bounds read. Remember this, it's not the first time it'll come up in this video. In fact, there's another one coming up literally right now. Real entries in the scene exit list, of course, will only ever point you to real entries in the master entrance table. But we are reading lighting data as an entrance table index now. The lighting data might have any old value. In fact, the entrance table only has 1,556 entries in it, but lighting data could hold numbers up to 65,535, over 40 times larger. This means that if we have a loading zone that specifies an exit, even just one entry past the scene's exit list, the lighting data found there has the capability of pointing us to any address in the entrance table and tens of thousands of addresses beyond it, reading whatever we find there as our destination scene and spawn point. Another out of bounds read, limited by whatever values happen to reside in the lighting data that immediately follows the scene's exit list. Let's again step through an example in Dodongo's Cavern. If there were a theoretical loading zone in this scene with exit index five, it would point past the Dodongo's Cavern exit list, which only has two members, and into the scene's lighting data. The data found here is 6733, much larger than the largest entrance table index of 613, but we interpret it as such an index anyway. So what data can we find that far past the entrance table? Well, it depends on what version of the game is being played. Various releases of Ocarina of Time have their contents shuffled around a bit, but for this example, let's choose the most commonly played and competitive version, NTSC 1.2. Assuming we are child link in daytime for a plus zero offset, we will use 6733 plus zero as our entrance table index. At entrance index 6733 on this version, we will find the value 0F000000. The first byte 0F will be interpreted as the destination scene for this fake entrance. And what scene is that? Well, wouldn't you know it, good old tower collapse interior exit. The next byte of 00, zero luckily works out as the only valid spawn for this scene, and the zeros in the transition settings data is always going to be safe. So to summarize, a loading zone with exit index 5 inside Dodongo's Cavern will point past the DC exit list to the value 6733 contained in the scene's lighting data, which, when interpreted as an index into the game's entrance table, points way past the table's end to load scene 0F, spawn 0, the Redead Bridge right before the Ganon fight. And we can test this with one small hack. Let's take this loading zone into Dango's Cavern. Currently, it has exit index one, as highlighted here, to flag it as a loading zone with the first value in the scene's exit index, 242, which points to Death Mountain Trail in the entrance table. If we change this one to a five, it will use the fifth value in the scene's exit list, 6733, an out of bounds read into the scene's lighting data. And as expected, simply by changing this one number, the loading zone takes us to collapse instead of Death Mountain Trail. And just to drive home the point, loading zones are not special polygons. We can do this exact same hack on any random floor polygon in Dodongo's Cavern. These all start with exit index zero to indicate that they don't warp you anywhere. But if we just change that to a one, we get a normal loading zone to Death Mountain Trail. And if we change it to a five, we get that same glitch loading zone to collapse. So as mentioned before, value 6733, when read as an index into the entrance table, points us to this data, which is read as destination scene 0F, 
spawn point zero in that scene, and transition settings data zero. This value will always be found here at this point in memory. It never changes. But like, what if it did? Or even better, what if we could control it? Or if not this particular one, what if we found a scene exit index that points us to a place in memory that we have direct control over as the player and read that as the destination of our warp? If this were possible, we could fill this memory with exactly the number we want and essentially create a variable loading zone, one capable of sending us anywhere we like. To begin searching for this, we will have to look through all 31 scene exit options. To continue our example in Dodongo's Cavern, we know the first two in the list are legit exits to Death Mountain Trail and King Dodongo, and we know from our example that the fifth one always leads to collapse. That leaves 28 other scene exit options to check, and since the arrangement of memory after the entrance table is different between versions of OOT, we can check all 28 on each version. Luckily, dedicated folks have already done this search for us, so we can take a look at its most fruitful result. Let's turn our attention to Dodongo's Cavern Scene Exit 22 on the GameCube version of the game, either the Master Quest or Collector's Edition discs. If a loading zone here has a 22 as its exit index, and we look up the out of bounds 22nd entry in the scene's entrance table, we will find value 1E00, again intended to be part of the scene's lighting data, but now being forcibly interpreted as an entrance table index. If we take this loading zone as child at nighttime, we will add a plus one offset and go to entrance table index 1E01. The data we will find here is documented as a variable named S Audio Enemy Vol. This is the variable that controls volume of small enemy music, and it's entirely based on Link's proximity to the nearest enemy. The value varies between a minimum of zero and a maximum of 7F, and is followed by three bytes of zero padding. Since scene IDs vary between zero and only 6E, and zero is always a safe value for your spawn point and transition settings, suddenly we have a candidate for a fully controllable loading zone that can send us to any scene we like. Let's hack in a test. Here we are in Dodongo's Cavern on the GameCube version of the game, near a place where small Dodongo enemies will pop up out of the ground and trigger proximity-based music. As the enemies get closer to Link, the volume increases and vice versa. Let's take this floor polygon right in front of us and hack its exit index to be 22, pointing us to the out of bounds 22nd member of the exit list, 1E00. Since we are child link at nighttime, our destination will be controlled by the value at entrance table index 1E01, which is actually the volume of the enemy music. So now depending on what the volume is at the moment we step on the loading zone, we will end up in totally different scenes. Even better, the volume value doesn't reset if the enemy dies or unloads. So we could just do a spacing setup to kill it with a projectile at a known distance away, freezing the volume at the desired value based on that distance, and stroll on into our controllable loading zone. So there you have it, a loading zone that can warp to literally any scene and is fully controllable by the player in real time. We did it. Hmm. Well, I guess we still got there by hacking the polygon's exit index to be 22, didn't we? Hmm. Okay. So we just need a glitch to be able to edit a polygon's exit index. How hard could it be to change one little number? Well, turns out we have no idea how to do that, none at all. So if we can't change one of the existing collision polygons, what options do we have? I mean, I guess we could always make a brand new polygon from scratch. That sounds easier, right? Why change one little number when you could painstakingly create an entire data structure to match what the game expects of a collision polygon with the exact properties we need in the scene we need it at a position in 3D space which is both reachable and conveniently placed with just a controller on a vanilla version of the game? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. So far, we've been working backwards. It's time to go all the way back to the very beginning in the long forgotten era of late 2017. The story of this whole glitch begins here when a much younger and slightly less awesome version of myself posted a video titled Dodongo's Cavern Collision Disappearance. I had been messing around duplicating the main room of the dungeon, a trick used in other parts of the game in mainstream speedrun routes to collect multiple instances of the same item or upgrade. There isn't much in this room worth duplicating, I was just exploring random ideas. Suddenly, something no one had ever seen before happened. Much of the environment's collision had disappeared. 
I was using cheats to levitate around and explore this oddity, and then my game crashed. Leaving aside the crash for a moment, what happened here? And how do you duplicate a room in the first place? Or for that matter, what's a room? In OOT, a scene is divided into rooms, independently loaded sections of the map which contain the textures, actors, and other components of the space. Rooms often take on the colloquial definition, being separated by doors, which are the trigger to unload the previous room and load the next. But just as often, and especially in overworld areas, rooms might be divided by seemingly empty space, and the transition between them is nearly seamless, barring a tiny lag spike if you know what you're looking for. In these cases, the transition is handled by an actor I'll call a load plane, a big rectangular prism which triggers a transition when Link touches it. The one that I'm showing you is of a type that is completely invisible and toggles back and forth between two states depending on which room is currently loaded. Touching the plane toggles it to the opposite state and switches the loaded room. This kind of load plane is often used in cleverly constructed narrow passageways to hide the jarring disappearance and reappearance of your surroundings, with both rooms including just a little bit of the other modeled and replicated to give the illusion of a seamless transition. But there's another kind of load plane too, a fog load plane, like the kind in the straight and open room transitions of the Lost Woods, or more topically, Dodongo's Cavern. Rather than instantly toggling between two rooms upon touching it, this type of load plane actually loads the next room, fades out the fog so you can see both of them, keeps both rooms loaded on either side for a brief transition period, and then fades out your view of the previous room before unloading it. This fog plane has an interesting exploit associated with it due to the complexity of trying to deal with both rooms at once and tracking which room is the current one and which the previous. If you manage to get around one of these, onto the side of the unloaded room with the room you came from still loaded on the other side, entering the transition space does something unexpected. The already loaded room loads again. It is considered to be both our current and previous room. Notably, all the actors in the room will be duplicated. If we now exit the transition area from the direction we came, the previous room unloads, still leaving us with one copy remaining. And because the actors inside it only unload when zero copies of the room remain, all the duplicates still stick around. In this way, we can continue to enter and exit the transition to toggle between two and one copies of the room, adding a new set of actor duplicates each time. This can lead to interesting problems, as the region of memory devoted to holding actors and other things begins to fill, sometimes leaving no room for certain actors which will disappear as a result. When I discovered the disappearance of Collision in Dodongo's Cavern, all I just described was already well understood. Speedrunners had come to expect corrupted textures and multiplied or missing actors from room duplication. But missing collision was something quite new. So what happened? The extent of it wasn't truly understood and investigated for over six years. There are three major collision types in OOT. First is the soft kind of collision associated with most actors. Link can generally overlap with these a bit and they can push back on him with varying strength, some being so weak that you can run right through at low speeds, some requiring glitches to maintain the needed speed, and some simply being a bit too massive to overcome. These collision entities are 3D shapes, and collisions with them deal with the math on the overlap of those shapes. This kind of collision is mostly irrelevant to the rest of this video, so you can forget about it for now. Next is the hard collision of the static and unchanging environment. Walls, floors, ceilings, vines, and ladders fall into this category. All of a scene's environment collision is always loaded, regardless of whether the room for that area of the map is loaded to give it texture. For this reason, I'll call this scene collision from now on. These collision entities are two-dimensional polygons, triangles, and anything colliding with them is just considered to be a single point, its coordinates in 3D space. The last kind of collision lies in the middle. Some actors have seemingly the same kind of hard collision as the environment, but unlike the environment, actors are dynamically loaded and unloaded as Link moves between rooms. And some of these actors need to be able to move, something scene collision is incapable of. In this category, we have things like Armos statues, treasure chests, the elevator platforms, and the giant Dodongo's skull's lower jaw. We call this collision type dynamic polygons, or dynapolis for short. Dynapolis have a limited amount of space available for them in memory. A scene can only hold a few hundred of these polygons, which generally is no problem at all since they're used relatively sparingly and often for very simple and boxy 3D shapes. But combine this limited capacity for Dynapolis with the ability to duplicate the Dynapoly actors along with their parent rooms, 
and suddenly chaos can ensue. If you dupe enough of them to go over the limit, they will begin to overflow into neighboring regions of memory, overriding what should be there. Most notably, this overflow can corrupt a list that keeps track of the static scene collision. This corruption was the cause of the disappearance of scene collision from my video in 2017. The main room of Dodongo's cavern has an unusually large number of dinopolies between the elevators and the particularly intricate model of the Dodongo jaw. So it only took me a few room duplications to witness this overflow and subsequent corruption. Once this was understood, the road was paved for some smart folks to start asking some smart questions. Take Natalia Has Died, for example. He's smart folks. And in January 2024, he asked a smart question. What if we could control this Dynapoly overflow to corrupt the scene collision in a useful way? After all, loading zones are part of the scene collision. What if we could make one? Remember like four hours ago when I said we were gonna do just that? Well, welcome to step one. First, we need a little more information on the scene collision data that's being corrupted by the Dynapoly overflow. Scenes are subdivided into sectors, tiled boxes of 3D space which handle collision independently from any other. When Link is in a certain sector, only the polygons in that sector are considered for collision as a nice little optimization. The scene's collision data exists as a collection of linked lists in a big table, with each sector corresponding to a list for floor polygons, a list for walls, and one for ceilings. Each node in each of these lists contains just a polygon ID, which is an index into a table of polygon data, and the index for the next node in the linked list. With this structure, the game can quickly and efficiently traverse all of the polygons that might be a candidate for collision at any given moment. Let's consider a contrived and simple example. Let's say we have a small scene with only one sector, which in turn contains only three polygons, all floors. The collection of nodes for this scene will be together in one linked list and might look something like this. The first entry, index zero of the node list, has poly ID four, telling the game to look at entry four in the separate polygon table to find this node's polygon data. And it also has a next node index value of one, telling the game where to find the next node in this sector's list of floors. This chain proceeds to the end when the final node's next index value is FFFF as a signal that no more nodes will follow. Now let's say we dupe just enough Dynapoly in this little scene that they overflowed and overwrote the contents of just the very first node in our list. The zero index node now has poly ID 999 and next index two. With this corruption, there is no node in the list whose next index value points to the node with index one. So this node has been orphaned from the list and its polygon can no longer be considered for collision with the player, effectively making that polygon disappear from gameplay. Additionally, the poly ID 999 in the first node tells the game to find this polygon's data at index 999 in the polygon table, an index well past the end of this table in our example. You're an expert on this now, another out of bounds read. It might not surprise you to learn that upon discovering this, the OOT scientists' first thoughts were, can we read a polygon from somewhere beyond the polygon table where we control the data? And of course, the answer is we sure can. To find this, we first will start from a setup which causes reliable corruption of the node list. Simply enter the dungeon, blow up the first wall, then use some glitches to get behind this fog load plane between the main room and the baby Dodongo hallway. Dupe the main room three more times, and much of the collision will be missing, indicating corrupted node lists. We can now analyze these corruptions for anything advantageous. After much searching, we ended up finding something useful. This room dupe setup ended up corrupting the first node of the floor polygon list for the sector shown here by overriding its poly ID with value 7FFF. This index leads to an out of bounds read on the polygon table and ends up reading values from a region of memory called the frame buffer. Here, on every frame, the game writes the color data of all of the pixels that are drawn to the screen. Well, actually, there are two frame buffers, one for even frames and one for odd frames, so that one can be built while the other is used to display the current frame. However, on the GameCube version of the game, the memory for the N64 frame buffer is actually only updated and used for the low-res screenshot that the game puts behind your menu whenever you pause. The polygon table's out-of-bounds index 7FFF puts us in the middle of the second frame buffer, and we will therefore attempt to read the color data of this line of eight pixels 
in the background image from the last time the game was paused on an odd frame. So this is it, one final step. We just need to find a perfect viewpoint from which the color data of these eight pixels can be read as the polygon we've been looking to build. To do that, we first need to understand how the data for a polygon is structured so that we can mimic it properly. Each entry in this list of polygons is structured as shown, with some attributes shown in green directly relating to the structure of the polygon, and others in yellow being indices into further tables for where to find the actual polygon's data. These green ones we'll mostly ignore. They detail some mathematical properties of the polygon that will determine whether we can properly interact with it. But many values will work, so they'll be a low priority for our search criteria. The yellow ones are critical, however. The latter three are indices into a giant table of polygon vertex coordinates. This table contains vertex coordinates of all the real polygons in the scene. However, out-of-bounds indices are kosher here, so we could end up reading lots of unrelated memory as direct coordinates for the corners of our polygon. And the first one is the most complex. It's an index into a table of polygon types, each of which contain densely encoded information about various aspects of the polygon's behavior. These include such granular details as whether Epona is allowed to walk on it, whether it should trigger a void out, whether Link should jump off of it or simply fall, whether it should deal damage, such as in the case of spikes or lava, whether it's hookshottable, and much more. Buried in this tangle is the one piece we really need, the scene exit table index. If this value is not zero, then the polygon is considered to be a loading zone and will send you to the destination prescribed by the index in the scene's exit table. If you remember from earlier, this is our entry point into being able to warp anywhere. So we need our polygon type index to point to a place in memory that at least has the number 22 in the position for the polygon's exit index and acceptable values for anything else that might interfere with interacting with the polygon. Each of the frame buffer pixels has two bytes of RGBA formatted color data. Finding a viewpoint from which these eight pixels in a row can be perfectly interpreted as a working polygon was a bit painful made even worse by the realization that various emulators and graphics plugins and even console video settings might treat the colors a bit differently, leading to different values in the frame buffer even from exactly the same camera perspective. But eventually we got there, thanks largely to a script written by Mr. Cheese to detect working viewpoints live during gameplay. On a Wii or GameCube set to 480p output, standing in exactly this position at exactly this angle and holding target until the camera settles into a stable, zoomed view, causes our eight pixels to have this color data, which, when interpreted as a polygon, translates into this. An enormous triangle, many times larger than the actual map, but notably below us when we are in the relevant sector of the scene. And since you trigger a loading zone when it is the nearest polygon directly beneath you, it works perfectly. Finally, the plan for creating a controllable, variable loading zone out of thin air has form. In fact, we have the entire outline so it's a good time to summarize the whole plan up to this point. Our goal is to end up with a polygon in Dodongo's cavern that is a loading zone whose destination we can control ourselves. We learned that if a polygon in this scene is flagged with exit index 22, we will accomplish just that. The scene's exit list is only two members long, so using exit index 22, we will end up reading some of the scene's lighting data instead as an index into the entrance table for determining where the loading zone will go. This lighting data reads 1E00, and if we are child link at night for a plus one offset when interacting with the entrance table, we look at out-of-bounds index 1E01 in the entrance table to find our destination. The data here is the volume of basic enemy's proximity music, a value which ranges from 0 to 7F by our distance to the enemy, and then followed by three bytes of zeros, a perfect candidate for us, since scene numbers range from 0 to 6E, allowing the volume to select any scene we like, and with safe zero values for the spawn point and transition settings. We unfortunately do not know of a way to edit an existing polygon's data directly to have exit index 22, but now we do know of a way to potentially create such a polygon from scratch. If we dupe the main room of Dodongo's cavern a few times, there are enough dynapolys that they will overflow and corrupt the scene's collision node lists. If we do this carefully, we will be able to overwrite the poly ID of one of the nodes that survives the corruption. This causes the scene to consider there to be a polygon with an index beyond the polygon table. In our case, we corrupted a floor node in this sector to have polygon index 7FFF, which will read the polygon data from the color data of these eight pixels 
from the screenshot behind the pause menu on the last time the game was paused on an odd frame. And so now we just have to pause the game on an odd frame where the colors of these eight pixels correctly mimics a working polygon. That is, one whose vertices and normals allow it to be reachable from within the sector that the polygon belongs to, and one which is flagged with exit index 22, giving it our warp anywhere loading zone property. It's worth highlighting that this whole video has explained a literal 30 second segment of gameplay. Everything in the route up to this point is just the answer to the question, what's the fastest way to get behind the room transition in Dodongo's cavern with some item to kill both the baby Dodongo and Ganon? And from there, actually executing the dino warp is extremely simple to do. But under the hood, there's so much happening in so little time, and the work that has gone into understanding and planning it all is enormous. I could never have made this video without mountains of patient help and explanations for all of my ceaseless questions from many folks in the OOT Discord, such as Mr. Cheese, Natalia Has Died, Fig, Tharo, Kadmic, and others. OOT never dies, but that immortality is only made possible by a dedicated and passionate group of people all coming together to do stupid shit like creating new loading zones out of pixel colors. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed and that you learned something about our favorite game.